Hello and welcome to Swedish Art Council here in Stockholm. I'd like to wish you all a warm welcome to the seminar New Swedish Books Critics' Choice, uh, which is a part of the Gothenburg Book Fair Fellowship Alternative Program in 2020. And we here are going to spend the next 30 minutes to talk about children's and young adults books released this year in Sweden. My name is Hanna Gerdvik and with me here today I have a panel of three excellent critics to analyze uh, contemporary stories, magical realism, picture books, stories for both children and adults, fantasy and maybe even a fairy tale. We'll see about that. And here to share their expertise is in children's literature is Lotta Olsson. You're a critic and editor at Children's and Young Adult Books Reviews at the newspaper Dagens Nyheter. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Malin Nauwerk, you are a critic as well as a culture editor and you are also a researcher in comparative literature at Swedish Institute for Children's Book. That's right. Welcome. Thank you. And Johanna Stenlund, you run one of Sweden's most popular book blogs bonus book tips and you are also you also freelances as a reading promoter giving book tips yeah welcome pleasure to be here yeah great to have you here all well, let's start and let's dive into this most exciting part uh, of this your choices of the year and Lotta also let's start with your first book it's Anna Höglund, uh, The Child Who Couldn't Close Her Eyes, a book about chi a child and a dog. And the child, I think, is on the front side of the book. What kind of book is this? I'm, I'm not really sure that it's a children's book, <laughs> because it, it's very special. And uh, it's, it, even the cover is a bit horror-like, with the, the, the eyes of the child are cut out of the, of the cover staring like uh, black uh, dots or something and you or see holes, kind of yeah, black uh, holes. Well, you see the space or something in bes besides and it is a very a very unique uh, picture book for all ages i would say and possibly grown ups could be a bit terrified by the fact that it's it's almost of biblical proportions it starts with and it came to pass this child is born where, and nobody cares for it and it's, uh, it's taken into custody by a, a blind dog who doesn't see anything and they, they live on a garbage heap and uh, the child has this problem of seeing too much and not being able to shut off the world and the first time I read it it was really no, no, this doesn't work. And then I had to read it again. Yeah. And it's, it's very close to a horror story, but it's also very um, existential. It sort of covers a big question of um, being, having to cope with the world, the, the troubles in the world, the, the see, seeing too much or doesn't see any, anything at all. And... Uh, and it has beautiful pictures and there is there are lots of references to mythological and biblical uh, well diff different uh, there is a there is a ball of yarn uh, as yeah. in the greek myth and there is a praying mantis that is definitely seeing more than anyone else and so on and the child kind of walks around in a society or a city yeah. and sees all these horrible things that she can't close her eyes to avoid to see. What is it that she, sees, she uh, sees around? This is, this is very, um, very up to date because what the child sees is all the people looking in their cell phones. And so, so the people around her doesn't see anything because they, they have another world mm. to watch. And she moves between different worlds. She looks through windows. She becomes um, a window cleaner, and she looks through the windows to different kind of people who, who live different and very sad lives. And uh, at last, she, she, can't, she can't cope with it, so she has to go down to the underworld where it's dark and she doesn't see anything. 
And it, I think it can be scary to grown-ups, but I think for the right child, it's a perfect book. And there is hope in it, isn't it? Of course, there's lots of hope. <laughs> it's like the Bible, it has everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Marlin, now, uh, your choice, your first choice is a picture book called After the Storm by debutant Ida Louisa Rudolfsson, a story about Sam who lives on an island where it's often very windy. What happens? Yes, this is the book I brought, uh, a beautiful picture book. Uh, the story or the plot is actually kind of vague in this book. It's a dream story. It takes place in a dream. Um, when Sam is sleeping, and it's very windy, as you said, a uh, storm is running across her island, she hears about a lost airplane. A plane has gone down somewhere, and she hears this on the radio. And then in her dream, she starts to fantasize um, and that is really the story. Uh, she follows a rope, which sort of finds its way into her bedroom, and she goes out into the storm and walks through different kind of landscapes to finally actually find uh, the plane, the lost plane. Um, so that is the narrative thread. But there is also a literal thread in this book, because what's so beautiful about this book is that it's actually embroidered. So it's, it's a textile um, scrapbook almost, or a collage. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the rope is an embroidered rope. So every illustration in this book is actually a work of textile art. So what this debutant so beautifully does is that she brings together a very contemporary um, art <laughs> trend, <laughs> I suppose, with international children's books tradition. So the dream story, we've seen that before as a motif uh, in picture books. Uh, and here I think uh, we have some very like overt clues on what books she <laughs> she has been inspired by. We have this little... And that is, would you say? That's, that is, I would say, uh, Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, which is yeah. also a sort of fantasy story about a child in a... Well, here's a tiger suit. In, in Sendak's story, it's a wolf suit. Um, so it's really about the child's way of traveling through imagination, going to a different world. And here uh, it's done so beautifully and so consistent, I think, with the textile because the, the thread that you literally follow here is this embroidered rope. So it's, it comes together so well, I think, uh, this book. And also, uh, there is, it's kind of the pictures and, and the text kind of blend into each other. It, it doesn't always, the picture stands for themselves and it doesn't always say the same thing as, as the text. I think you can, you can see in the embroidered illustrations that a lot more happens actually in the pictures than in the kind of sparse um, and, well, not very elaborate text. It's, uh, it's about the meeting between the two, of course, as it often is in, in picture books. Um, and what I found so, I don't know, like the, the brilliant thing about this book is how this rope that you follow sort of t takes different shapes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you can see how this, this child, Sam, she, she follows a rope which first becomes a swing and then it becomes a lasso and then it becomes something to balance on yeah. uh, to get through these different dream landscapes. And you doesn't get too many answers, do you? It's kind of it, the mystery kind of uh, embedded. Uh, it is like mysterious as a dream, I yeah, think. Yeah. But for me, the subtext was about actually being able to get away uh, through imagination. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marlene. Johanna, do you agree? Is this one of your favorites? It is. I'm so amazed by the embroidery and the fact that she has actually done every stitch like throughout the whole book. Mm. And I would really look forward to see an exhibition with the originals of yes. this one, because I'm mm. sure it's quite amazing. Mm. It's not that common, I think, in, in Swedish children's books tradition to, to use textile this way. No, it's, it yes. feels very original, very new as an aesthetic expression. Yeah. Mm. And we're going to continue with you, Marlene, because your next book is f uh, for a little bit older children, six to nine years. Mm -hmm. It's The Land of Lindworms. And who and what do we meet in The Land of Lindworms? Well, this is also uh, a story about imagination, I suppose, but it's very different. Um, 
This is more of a fantasy story. It's written by Frida Nilsson, who is a lovely author. Um, and she has written many acclaimed works before this one. Um, it's about two brothers, orphan brothers. One day they f get a, an offer <laughs> to leave a, a poor life where they have to work really hard, where they have no one to love them. Um, and they are invited into a magical world um, of lindworms, into a castle where um, a queen, a lindworm queen lives, and she is possibly, well, their new caretaker. They go there, um, but things aren't really as good as <laughs> they had hoped for, I suppose. Uh, soon conflicts arise, jealousy, um, something mysterious is going on with this lindworm, uh, and it, it takes a very dark turn, this story. Um, a very dark turn. But <laughs> we should not say <laughs> more about that, or? No, I, I, no, I think that would be a spoiler, but, yeah. but, but I would say that the general themes about this book uh, are, as with Anna Haglund, existential. They are about how to cope in a world where it's difficult to be a child yeah. and where adults are not always maybe as responsible as they should be in relation to children. Uh, it's about uh, children's right to be taken care of uh, and to be loved. And what is so beautiful is that she, Frida Nilsson, lingers in, I think, the, well, the insecurity of, of children, of, of do I deserve this right to, to have a parent, to be loved? And you can really feel that as a, as a human when you read it. It's, it's for everyone. It's an existential question for everyone. Um, yeah, we can recognize this motive mm. of the orphan mm. and the child uh, from uh, children's literature in the history as well. Yeah, and still this feels so new. It feels like such a fresh take on it. I came to think about how we discuss these is issues today, about uh, do parents have the right to children, uh, at what cost are you allowed to get a child. Mm. Yeah, and I think this is super interesting because uh, Frida Nilsson is a multi-award-winning author and very, very well known, as you said. And she's also been called uh, Astrid Lindgren's mm. successor. And you have been looking at Astrid Lindgren's work in your research. Mm. So, from your point of view, what unites Frida Nilsson with Astrid Lindgren? Mm. I think it's a very good comparison and a relevant comparison. I think, well, they're both extremely talented authors, obviously. It's the loyalty with a child. It's the not turning away from very difficult topics. It's um, about, in this book, I think there is actually a, a direct reference maybe to um, a work by Lindgren called uh, Rasmus and the Vagabond. But I think it's also the, well, the book can be dark, but it has um, an ending <laughs> which is, well, it's hopeful, but it's not um, idyllic or idealistic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. the way out, yeah, the possible yeah. way out. Mm. Is it a fantasy or is it a fairy tale, would you say? I would say a fairy tale, yeah. I think, because it starts in one kind of fairy tale and then the fairy tale sort of gets another level. It reminds me a little bit about the Bri Brother of Lionheart as yeah, well. It yeah. uh, starts with a very dark, um, almost historical setting where children have to work hard and where, uh, well, they are exploited. Um, and then you step into this forest of lindworms and talking animals. I was thinking about uh, Brother of Lionheart meeting Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Marlene. Thank you. Uh, and now let's talk a little bit about books for older children. Uh, Johanna Stenlund, Elin Nilsson's Underwater World. It's a collect collection of short stories for the age 9 to 12, and this is one of your favorites. Why? Well, uh, Elin Nilsson in general is one of my personal favorites. I really enjoy her way of writing. And uh, she did publish uh, another short story collection that was nominated for the August Prize a few years ago. And I would say that she, she has really taken it to the next level in this one. So I would say this one is even better, actually. Um, she has this thing for writing stories about everyday life, but there is always some kind of twist to it. And it's always about like, the small problems that 
sometimes tend to get rather big. And she has a really nice children's perspective. So all these short stories are about children in different situations in life. There is one um, younger brother who is living in the family where uh, they live with a father and their stepmom and they just had another baby and the father and, and the mother and they haven't got home yet so the brothers are on their own for a while and, and then during this short story the younger brother gets to know that the big brother has decided to to move to to go to boarding school really and um, the inner life of this younger brother when he reveals this is quite interesting to to follow and she she really does this like a basic story but then there are always this inner life that is very rich in these kids so i think a lot of children would uh, recognize themselves in one or several of the stories actually it's in the details and in the kind of um the, the emotional and the inner life, as you say, it's very, uh, it feels very near. Yeah, she has a very good way of expressing feelings. And, and I don't feel like, um, well, I am an adult, but I read a lot of children's books. And, and I would say that she really puts the finger on uh, explaining things and feelings and emotions in a very, uh, you really feel that it is the, the voice of this child. It's not an adult trying to tell the oh, story the of this child. The children's perspective yeah, is there all really. the time. It's very humoristic. It, it is. Yeah. She has a lot of twists in the plots as well. I mean, sometimes you read nearly the full novel and then you realize in the end that there is some kind of magic to it and something that happens that you're like, okay, but everything was realistic up until now and then it takes another turn. And I really like that. It's yeah. a lot of surprises when yeah. you read. What do you say, Lotta? Do you agree? Do you like this book? Yeah, she has this s very subtle way of showing feelings that get uh, that, that that are universal, universal in the the ordinary day life. Yeah. Which is, I think that's the best. That's the reason we all read children's books. Yeah. That they have they have a way of showing mm -hmm. the things we we meet every day, we, all of us do, the, the way of being human. I think she has a nice way also of showing like the class perspective as well, mm. because there yeah. all of them are represented. I mean, some are well, well off, but others really, they have friends who brag about their vacation and shouldn't you join us for this charter trip to Greece or whatever. And this girl is like, no, and tries to make up reasons for why she cannot come. She, maybe she should go to New York later, and but she ends up in a caravan with her yeah. mom on a camping site. And so they're very embarrassed by it. Yeah. yeah. So and, and it's such a nice way of showing it, and it's not like pointing out that something is right or wrong. It's just a fact and, and, and the different circumstances for these kids. Yeah. I really like it. I, I thought we're going to cling on to that because your next, bo next book is... Uh, uh, Esther uh, Eriksson, uh, Christina Sigenstotter and Esther Eriksson has done the illustration of Humlan Hansson's Secrets, yeah. which also is a book about 9 to 12 years old, I think, and also everyday life and emotions and family and mm. relationships and friends. What can we say about that? When I first read this, I was, I jumped with joy, <laughs> I would mm. say. Mm. I love this book. I think it's Why? the best that I've read in a long time. <laughs> I love it also. Uh, so. yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, we spoke about Astrid Lindgren before, and I grew up being one of the fans to Barbara Lindgren. Mm -hmm. And when I read this for the first time, it was like, I mean, it is a unique voice, but at the same time, I can hear Barbara's mm -hmm. voice in the back of my head. And also with Esther's uh, drawings, they are actually from... Sometimes, at least, they remind me of the black and white drawings that uh, mm -hmm. Barbara Lindgren does in her pictures, in, in some of her books. Yes, it's very char characteristic and very uh, dark yeah, and uh, they are. a little bit twisted and funny. It is. I mean, it is a diary of Humlan's life. And she comes back to school after having chicken pox. And she's been off for like two weeks. And those two weeks just changed her whole world. And her best friend is no longer playing with her. She has decided to start playing with these super dangerous horse girls. They are just crazy, running around in their panties and playing 
pretending to be horses. And very cool and popular, aren't they? Uh, I'm no? not no? sure, no? but at <laughs> least they are some kind of gang that people yeah. are scared of. They are crazy, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and since Hongland has been such a good friend with Noor, she has revealed a lot of secrets. They've shared so much and now she's terrified that Noor will tell her secrets to these horse girls or to like she doesn't care anymore so she can tell them to anyone a and um, so you get to follow her inner thoughts about these and how she reacts on the school like she feels like she's an aquarium she has to go and cry in the toilet of the school and um, sometimes she has these dark hours where she goes out in the middle of the night and I mean in some of these parts you don't know really if this is realism or if it's fiction and fantasy if it's her imaginary world or if she actually does this because it's kind of crazy from time to time um, and speaking of crazy she also has this aunt who uh, who um, loses her spark from time to time <laughs> and uh, she needs to spend time in the psychic award or psychic ward sorry and um, Humlan loves her aunt so she does her best to to help her, try her to make make her want to do art again and make her feel better. So she doesn't only have this life in school that she has to care about, she also has to worry about this aunt. So. And yeah. how do you think she copes with all these problems and the sorrow she carries? Um, I mean, she doesn't share it really. You, you can tell from, from her writing that sometimes she's close to reveal this to her parents. But her parents, they are so used to her being very, very tight with this best friend, so they don't even ask her. And, and she pretends that it's as business as usual. And they are supposed to go to for summer vacation together. And, and she just pretends that that's going to happen, but she doesn't know. So I think, I mean, she's very lonely in it, but she goes to this aunt and she gets some, even though she doesn't reveal that much to her either, she still gets some comfort, I would say. But yeah, she has this guy friend or he, he wants to become a couple, but she's not interested. He's too shy and too boring. But so I would say she, she's coping okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but here's also some kind of dark and a little bit twisted humor, uh, humoristic it is. tone. I mean, you laugh a lot and you also feel very sorry for her. So it's very dark from time to time, but it's also joyful and, and, and crazy. So, yeah. I like the the roller coaster of the yeah. story, actually. <laughs> yeah. What do you like it about? Uh, I think for me, it was one of those reading experiences where you realized a new character is born. Mm. Uh, this personality is just so apparent. <laughs> she she has a voice. She has a tone. Mm. She has a sense of humor. She has a look. Um, yeah. You you just feel the instant classic of it all yeah. when you read it. I mean, I really mm. hope that they will, there will be a sequel because mm. it's mm. such an amazing voice, as mm. you say. Mm. And um, this emo kid in, in this world, because normally when you read these that are sort of realism around age 11 or so, then, I mean, it, it's realism through, through it all. But here it's so fun to see these turns as well. So, yeah, I really hope we get to see more about it. Yeah, let's hope. Thank you very much, Joanna. And over to you again, Lotta. Uh, the last book of today, uh, Camilla Sten, The Missing, which is a kind of a thriller and magical realism, or um, what would you say? I was thinking about that uh, this morning because it's, uh, it's, uh, well, what is it? <laughs> what is it? it? It's, it's sort of a ghost story it could be yeah, but yeah. we are not really we don't really know what we do know is that in this little northern village uh, Järvshöga there is a there's a boarding school the oldest in Sweden that has um, all the rich kids and the boys obviously it's just the boys and and there's this the ordinary village around it uh, has rather poor people and our protagonist is um, Julia who who goes to the ordinary school in the ordinary village and has an ordinary job and meets these rich kids and there's, there's a class difference but 
Um, the main story is that there is this young kid who disappears, an 18-year-old from the boarding school, a boy who just walks out into the forest. And uh, Julia gets interested and realizes that this has happened before, but nobody talks about it. So, well, it does happen here, you know, they walk. <coughs> it happens that boys and men walk off. And, and she goes like, what, 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 what was that? Is it, does it happen a lot? Mm -hmm. And she realizes that it has been happening for a long time. And it's not, yeah. only, it's not only from the boarding school, obviously. And the and book also tells a story from the 60s. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there, is, uh, there has been a waitress working at the bo boarding school who, whose story is intertwined with this story of Julia in, in, now, in the now, in the present. And uh, she has been, it, it's all connected to the winter solstice in some way. Mm -hmm. And we realize that uh, there is some magic going on because all these boys and men seem to be lured out into the forest. It's sort of an enchanted forest. It's, they, they have this, they hear this sound, the uh, smell. There's something out there that is very, that wants them to go into the forest, but they're also lost in their lives. Something has happened. They, they are alone. They, they have to leave in, well, we don't know we don't really. Know. And, uh, and it, it's very much uh, Swedish, northern, Nordic mm -hmm. mythology. Which is a trend, I think. And kind of this Nordic noir meets uh, yeah. <laughs> mythology. <laughs> and it's also a mystery story with mm. Julia going, trying to find out what happened during the 60s. Mm. There's, something, there's something vaguely mm. odd about the headmaster, the old headmaster, mm. that seems to be connected to what's happening in some, some way. Mm. And so it has this quality of the, the crime story where they try to find out, they're looking at old papers and things like that, you know, interviewing old people. And I think this, and it's also an adventure story, but it has definite horror elements. And this is really the north of Sweden in the middle of the winter. And you have this, you know, the, the ice cold, very dark, lots of stars, and the snow and the silence in the, in the forest and then suddenly you hear something and if you're from Sweden you know this yeah and also the silence from the village who doesn't yeah. speak about this yeah but what, what what is it that you like so much about it what, what's unique with uh, the missing I think it's the tone it's almost always the tone I I love about books some books that uh, Camilla Steen has been writing for children before together with her mother written a trilogy set in the Stockholm archipelago and uh, she has also written horror for um, for grown-ups and uh, but she has this this sad tone of a teenager who knows that she doesn't have all the possibilities that the the guys on the boarding school have mm. The, she, she knows that her, well, her mother has been, had problems, it seemed to be uh, psychic problems. I, I like that with Psychic Award. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a Freudian slip. Yeah, it <laughs> but uh, it, this really is a meeting, a meeting for losers, you know. They are losers from different parts of the, of, the, of society and it, also the rich kids are losers. Mm. And um, there are, the, it's a lot of discussion about hierarchies and uh, how you get power over other people and how, how, you, how you interact with other people. And um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of layers in it. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's a book for young adults. And uh, the difference between books for young adults and books for grown ups is that often it's a little more fun to read the young adults. <laughs> it happens a lot more. <laughs> thank you very much, Lotta, and thank you all for coming here today and sharing all your fantastic choices and books for us today. Uh, anything more you'd like to add about this book year? Mm. 
It's a great year. A great <laughs> year for Swedish books. <laughs> it's a great year for Swedish books. And it's it's a good thing about Corona. It really doesn't affect the the yeah. books. Or the they reading. Were, or the reading. The yeah. reading is still here. We can yeah. still go to other worlds. Yeah. Let's keep that with us. Uh, thank you so much, Lotta Olsson, Marlin Nauerk, and Johanna Stenlund. My name is Hanna Edvik, and thank you for joining us today here at Swedish Arts Council. Bye.